Now to the 21st presentation here at the British Columbian Camp 1983 and this of course is 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning. Let's turn now to John the, I mean, I beg your pardon, Matthew the third chapter and number 21. 21. 21. Let's turn now to Matthew the third chapter and the first verses, well, mainly, mainly chapter, 20, uh, chapter 3 at the moment. Matthew chapter 3. Start with verse 13 and uh, we'll read down to the end of the chapter which is only four or five verses altogether. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering, said unto him, Suffer to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is the record in Matthew of the baptism of Jesus Christ, and uh, we have further comments on this in the book Desire of Ages, page 111, for the moment and as you recall of course yesterday morning we read uh, something of what Christ could see at this point of time so far as his future was concerned and as I said yesterday it is the way of God to open before the eyes of his messengers a picture of what their future is going to be like not of course in every detail but in general terms and I personally found the same revelation given to me before I began this, this uh, work of preaching this message and the picture before Jesus Christ, of course, was a very vivid and a very real one because during the previous 30 years of his life he had tasted to the very depths, the bitterness, that is, the lot of those who are singular and unique because of their adherence to God's principles. Very, very few people in the world, of course, then, in fact, none in the world and apart from Jesus Christ, and very few in the world today understand and practice the principles of Sabbath rest. But Christ did, and thus incurred the wrath and the enmity of those around about him. We will now read the next two paragraphs beyond where we read la last night, or late yesterday afternoon, page 111, Desire of Ages. As one with us, he must bear the burden of our guilt and woe. The sinless one must feel the shame of sin. The peace lover must dwell with strife. The truth must abide with falsehood, purity and vileness. Every sin, every discord, every defiling lust that transgression had brought was torture to his spirit. Alone he must tread the path, alone he must bear the burden. Upon him who, laid, who had laid off the, of his glory and accepted the weakness of humanity, the redemption of the world must rest. He saw and felt it all, but his purpose remained steadfast. Upon his arm depended the salvation of the fallen race, and he reached out his hand to grasp the hand of omnipotent love. The Saviour's glance seems to penetrate heaven as he pours out his soul in prayer. Well, he knows our sin has hardened the hearts of men and how difficult it will be for them to discern his mission except the gift of salvation. He pleads with the Father to, for power to overcome their unbelief, to break the fetters with, with which Satan has enthralled them, and in their behalf to conquer the destroyer. He asks for the witness that God accepts humanity in the person of his Son. Now obviously, of course, there was great pressure on Christ not to go ahead with his consecration. But he went ahead regardless because of that spirit of submission which was in him. Now, in the next paragraph comes a very beautiful revelation of the principle of obedience, the principle of submission to God's will, the principle of putting the revelation of God's character before the manifestation of his character in us. I read now, Never before had, had the angels listened to such a prayer. They are eager to bear to their loved commander a message of assurance and comfort. Now let's pause right there a moment. The angels were eager to bear to their loved commander a mes message of assurance and comfort. Now you know of course that you yourself, uh, when perhaps a new believer comes in, into the message and that believer is in need of a message of encouragement, what do you find yourself motivated to do? Step in and give that encouragement, to, to shake the hand, to 
put your hand arm across the shoulder or whatever it might be to just give a word of encouragement and those angels who deeply loved Jesus Christ were drawn out at this point of time to go to Christ and personally give to him a message of hope and encouragement now if the only factor governing their behaviour was that had been their own hearts of righteousness what would they have done just that wouldn't they they would have gone to Christ they would have brought encouragement and assurance to him but the statement says but no the father himself will answer the petition of his son direct from the throne issue the beams of his glory the heavens are opened and upon the saviour's head descends a dove like form of purest light fit emblem, emblem of him the meek and lowly one so did those angels then live by their feelings or did they live by the word of God right they lived by the word of God and they would not live out their own impulses excepting they had a clear command from God to do so so very obviously what question did they ask before they moved what are, my orders? What are our orders and what are the promises and knowing their orders what do they do about them Obey. obeyed them right and the promises they believed them or trusted in them and therefore can we truly say the angels were holy angels <coughs> right holy angels because they were obedient and they were trusting and I think we should begin to appreciate why I keep stressing the point that these that these actions on the part of the angels and on the part of John the Baptist and on the part of Jesus Christ show us exactly how we are to obey we are not to carry out our own impulses but to first, first and foremost but to obey God first and foremost and we will find then of course in obeying him we shall be but carrying out our own impulses I mentioned of course that we don't read the statement uh, the reverse fashion we don't say when carrying out our own impulses we're obeying God that puts it in the reverse order of course but when obeying him we are but carrying out our own impulses and um, so the words were spoken by God himself the highest authority in the universe and therefore the greatest possible encouragement and blessing to Jesus Christ at this point of time now let's come back to Matthew the fourth chapter and we'll read the words there in regard to the first temptation Matthew chapter 4 begin with verse 1 down to verse 5 uh, verse 4 then was Jesus led up of the spirit of the wilderness to be tempted of the devil and when he had fasted forty days and forty nights he was afterwards and hungered and when the tempter came to him he said if thou be the son of God command that these stones be made bread and he answered and said it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God and of course in making that statement Jesus Christ was quoting an Old Testament scripture found in the 6th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy which we'll read a little later in our consideration of this matter now in verse 1 it says then was, then was Jesus led up of the spirits so who was the plan maker for this move on Christ's part to go to the desert for a period of time who was the plan maker God was through the Holy Spirit God made the plan the Holy Spirit communicated the plan to Jesus Christ so it was not Christ's plan so when he went what was he doing carrying out his order his father's orders and therefore as he went carrying out his father's orders and trusting in the Lord to provide whatever he might need in that place then of course he was manifesting a true spirit of holiness which is of course obedience and faith now in the book Desire of Ages we have some comments upon this uh, command page 114 and Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness the words of Mark are still more significant he says immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness forty days tempted of Satan and was with, with the wild beasts and in those days he did eat nothing when Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted he was led by the Spirit of God he did not invite temptation in other words this was not a, a throwing down of the gauntlet there wasn't a challenge on Christ's party he wasn't going in there to 
to particularly put himself in the way of temptation. He went there for a different purpose altogether, but it turned out that he was in the end very, very severely tempted by Satan. It says he went to the wilderness to be alone, to, be, to contemplate his mission and work. By fasting and prayer, he was to brace himself for the bloodstained path he must travel. But Satan knew that the Saviour had gone into the wilderness and he thought this the best time to approach him. Now why did Christ go to the desert? To fast and pray, to brace himself for the bloodstained path before him, before him. In other words, to spend more time still in preparation for his mission. And that thought impresses me very, very deeply because um, back in the Adventist church, for instance, the accent was on get out there and do mystery work. Get to work. Work, work, work was the idea. And the idea of preparation, of course, was not even thought about. And we tend, of course, to inherit those concepts and to think that our most important work today is to win souls and add to the size of the movement. That's not our most important work although it may be, of course, that God will use you to reach out and gather in further souls. Some believers are finding this to be their experience. Now, when I think back on those 30 years of preparation on Christ's part, the first 12 were spent prior to the first Passover visit, and so effective was the, was the preparation that experienced during those 30 years that at the end of a mere 12 years he could out to think, out question and out answer the best minds in the land of Israel. Now what kind of a person must he have been after, after 18 more years of that kind of preparation? He must have, been, must have been truly a most remarkable person with tremendous physical, mental and spiritual powers, marvellous mental, uh, physical, mental and spiritual powers. Yet after all that, despite the acceptance by God personally of his dedication when God said this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased Jesus still felt a very very definite need for more preparation still now do we find the same thing in the life of John the Baptist I remember the words I read them to you yesterday he looked upon the king and his beauty and self was forgotten remember he had bowed low before the king of kings and he felt himself inefficient and unworthy and you will find that the closer you come to God, the more time you spend in prayer, in the true science of prayer, the closer your communion with Him, the more you bow low before the King of Kings, the more you will feel the need of still further preparation, the more you will feel unprepared for the task before you, the less disposition you'll have to rush out and do a great work for God, and the more you will long to draw near it and become more and more able to do the work which He gives you to do. And Jesus Christ found the same response in his own heart and life, as I said we will too. And of course when he went out there, then uh, there was a confrontation between him and Satan. As we read, Satan came to him and said, Make these stones bread if you be the Son of God. After 40 days of fasting and prayer and utter and terrible loneliness in that desolate and barren place. And the pressure which was placed upon Jesus Christ at that point of time to give up his righteousness, to step outside the will of God, was truly enormous. And the very kind of pressure under which the men of God in the past had failed again and again and again. So let's now pick out the um, important points in this chapter. Remember, we're not dealing with every aspect of Christ's life, but just with those points which show us the practical way in which Christ applied the principles of holiness, how he obeyed God according to God's way of being served, how he left God always in his rightful place and recognised himself as being in his own rightful place as well. So we turn to page 118. Now, I make no apology for the fact we've spent time studying this chapter before. I've come back to it again and again and again and again, and I always find that the message in this chapter is very fresh and very important and bears repetition as many times as possible. Because as Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21 points out, we are to overcome how? As he overcame, right? And he says that those who overcome will sit down with him in his throne, even also as he overcame and am set down with his father in his throne. So therefore the study of how Christ gained the victory 
is a most important study because it reveals to us the way in which we likewise are to gain the same victory and therefore reign on the same throne with him eventually. <clears throat> now page 118 When Jesus entered the wilderness he was shut in by the Father's glory. Now shut in of course means to be surrounded by it to be protected by it and a person in that kind of situation enjoys a wonderful sense of security a wonderful sense of peace and rest a wonderful sense of confidence and one's heart is aglow with the conscious sense of God's presence and is it easy to, to obey God under those conditions? Mm -hmm. most certainly I should better ask the question is it easy to have faith in that position mm -hmm. obedience of course is a risky business because when you are shut in by, by the glory of God and you're full of confidence and um, enthusiasm then you're still prone to rush out and do your own thing is that right? because that doing your own thing is so deeply embedded in the human organism that as we learned yesterday or the day before it will take the cleansing process of both today or not just both but of today and the latter rain and Jacob's trouble to finally root out of us that deeply embedded wretchedness abomination that sin which separates us from God and, and, and prevents us from entering into a truly close relationship with him now if of course the glory of God had remained around Christ during those 40 days it would have been one thing but we find that the glory departed and he was left to battle with temptation <coughs> excuse me let's read those words again but the glory departed and he was left to battle with temptation it was pressing upon him every moment his human nature strengthened the conflict which awaited him for forty days he fasted and prayed weak and emaciated from hunger worn and haggard with mental agony his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men now was Satan's opportunity now he supposed that he could overcome Christ now first of all I want to make a list of all the pressures that were, that were brought to bear upon Jesus Christ at this point of time to cause him to turn aside from the will of God so let's put God's name there and Christ here God in heaven Christ upon this earth and Christ of course looked to his father and to nobody else for the plans to carry out in his day by day work now it was there was tremendous pressure upon Jesus Christ to, to go on living but uh, as, as those days went by during which no food was provided uh, to him by his heavenly father he was literally coming closer and close, closer to the very jaws of death in fact we'll read a little later that he fell dying to the ground after the third temptation when at last the angels were permitted or directed to come and sustain him and bring him back to life again but he was literally dying at the end of the third temptation that's how close this thing really came now there were, there were no human beings there now remember yesterday we made a list of the various uh, people through whom Satan worked to pressurize Jesus Christ first of all the rabbis then his own parents then his brothers and last of all the Pharisees okay and of course no doubt the people in general but now the pressure now is different the pressure now is uh, the pressure of circumstances now first of all naturally being a human being Christ would want to live for his own sake okay so for his own sake or perhaps I should put here rather than his own sake uh, his flesh because how many of us so far as our humanity is concerned welcome the idea of dying none of us do and as I read to you a moment ago it says on page 118 his human nature shrank from the conflict which awaited him so therefore there was the and I put this down as the minor not the most important and not the most powerful pressure that was, that was brought to bear upon Christ at that time now the most powerful pressure was he needed to live for for God's sake I put God's sake or for the kingdom's sake or for the sake of the victory because Jesus Christ knew perfectly well that the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 which began when the 490 years began in 457 BC and the 483 years came down to the beginning of Christ's ministry 
while the 490 years came down to the end of Christ's ministry and in the midst of that week three and a half years after this point when Christ is here in the desert then and not before Christ was to die and Christ knew he had to live from this point of temptation for the next three and a half years otherwise the plan of salvation would fail now to Christ which was the more, most important thing his own personal survival or the, uh, the uh, carrying out of God's work which was the most important the more important of those two things right and that was a tremendous temptation or pressure upon him now it was the same pressure that came upon Abraham when he and Sarah were childless now of course there was, there was the, the, the uh, problem of their flesh because they naturally wanted to have a child that was very very important to them and that, that desire to have a child was there but far more important in Abraham and Sarah's case was the knowledge that if this promise was not fulfilled if God could not keep the promise to give them a son then God certainly could not save the human race and therefore the pressure to have a son was very very heavy on Abraham and Sarah for the work of God's sake much more than for their own sake and for the sake of God's work they entered into a plan whereby they had a child whose name was Ishmael and which child they deemed to be the promised son until he was 13 years of age when God rejected that child in favour of Isaac the, un the, the, the as yet unborn child so the pressure then upon Abraham and Sarah was a pressure to do something for the sake of God's cause they remember a day or two ago we looked at the story of Jacob and uh, Rebekah when they be became deeply concerned about the birthright problem now when Rebekah schemed up this plan to deceive Isaac and have the birth dry blessing conferred upon Jacob then what was her major motivation her own pride or was it the work of God, work of God. Right, it was the work of God now under that pressure what happened did she fail or, did she fail or remain faithful she failed didn't she right and now we find Jesus Christ in the desert suffering the same kind of pressure exactly now I want to make the point and it's a very very important one that every time almost every time perhaps there were some occasions when not, I think that in the case of the boat upon the lake there was a, a, a different uh, situation but usually when God gives to us a specific command and we go forward in execution of that command and in the execution of it there arises a tremendous threat to our lives uh, and or to the work of God that Satan is very quick to provide a very easy way of escape which he makes look as if it is an offering from God for instance when God anointed David to be king of Israel through Samuel the prophets David um, went first of all to slay Goliath and he spent some time in the court of King Saul and when King Saul began to see the superior uh, qualifications in this young lad growing up he recognised that the kingship was going to go to him and Saul determined to slay David and so the acceptance of God's command to be the future king of Israel threatened David with destruction so he had to flee to the desert or the wilderness and there was this little band of men among whom there always could have been a traitor to betray him he was forced to move from spot to spot and from place to place and naturally of course this was very wearying to his flesh very threatening to his life it was an existence which no one would, would want to have to go through because he never knew when he would be caught up with and destroyed and then one day he's hiding in a cave as Saul's army draws closer and closer and actually stops outside the cave I can imagine David's heart stopping too at that moment of time mine certainly would have and then the king comes in alone into the cave and, and David's men said to him David they said God has made this opportunity for you to kill Saul kill him because this opportunity is the voice of God to you take the opportunity but David said no I have no orders to kill the king of Israel I have orders only to wait until God gives me the kingdom now was David in that moment of time carrying out the true principles of holiness Yes. absolutely right and even though he's been pressed him with the idea that he was a wonderful opportunity to 
to, to rid himself of his enemy and take the kingdom and therefore fulfill the promise of God David said no I will not fulfill God's promises God will fulfill his own promises in his own good time and way now sad to say of course a little later King David failed to maintain that kind of um, righteousness because he eventually concluded that Saul would accomplish his deadly purpose and destroy him and so David without consulting God led his 600 men into the land of the Philistines a place to which the Lord had never sent him and there he remained of course until the death of Saul in that great battle when, David, David, I mean, when Saul and Jonathan both lost their lives as you, will, as you will remember and then David came back first of all to Hebron and finally to Jerusalem where he became the king of Israel as God opened the way and not by David's own choosing now did Jesus Christ have an easy out in this desert situation even before we come to the stones being made bread issue certainly he did after he'd been there a week he said well after he'd been there for about a week shall we say he could have said well I'm getting awful hungry and if I if I keep this fast I'm going to die eventually so so I just slip down the mountain and uh, drop into my mother's house for a couple of hours and pick up some food and uh, carry, carry me back a big lunch bag to the mountain top again so I can, I can eat while I continue this matter of fasting and prayer. Now could he have done that? No, certainly he could have. But did he have orders to do it? No, he didn't have orders to do it. God has sent him without food to the desert and there he must remain without food until God saw fit to feed him. But in the meantime, in the meantime, it seemed as if he had been forsaken by God as if God had suddenly become preoccupied in some other direction and left, left Jesus Christ to live or die as he himself could best manage along the way and so Jesus Christ understanding the principles of holiness knowing that a Christian only moves by God's orders and of course being an individual who had established a very clear line of communication between himself and heaven he was full of the Holy Spirit was able to hear and receive the voice of God to him now another pressure I might add here of course uh, in respect to uh, that was there was the fact that he appeared forsaken oh, he appeared or seemed to be forsaken both by God and by men and when you appear to be forsaken both by God and by men then does that vastly increase the pressure on your part to do something to save yourself and save the cause of God yes. that, that, is, that, that certainly increases the pressure greatly if God was there for instance saying don't worry it's going to be alright I've got everything under control I'm right here and I'm, I'm, I'm in command just give me time it'll all work out okay if God was there saying that to you every few minutes well of course you'd get along quite well wouldn't you <laughs> there'd, be no, there'd be no real test of faith at all none whatsoever now bear in mind of course that during the time of Jacob's trouble these same pressures will be very heavily upon God's people they will be concerned about their, about the, their own flesh about the cause of God and they will appear to have been forsaken both by God and by men not only forsaken by men but the entire world will, 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 will be more than apparently they will be actually opposed to us and determined upon our destruction and in that time we shall have to gain the victories exactly as Jesus did and don't worry of course there will be an apparent easy way out for them during Jacob's trouble because the wicked will say look all you have to do is to renounce this foolishness come over to our side you'll be one of us and you have plenty of food and no more pressure of any kind whatsoever now this reminds me of um, what has happened unfortunately amongst one or two folk in the um, in the world field when God gave to us the message that God is my doctor I'm quoting Exodus 15 verse 26 and of course in your Bibles the King James Version you read that the Lord says I am the Lord that healeth thee but in the German Bible it says I am the Lord your doctor now the word arzt is used which means medical doctor it doesn't use the word doctor which can mean doctor of uh, science or doctor of philosophy or doctor of anything else you like to name but it says ich bin der Herr dein Arzt and that word Arzt is, can, can be used only as a medical doctor is that right Ruth? Yes. good I have verification from the German speaking part of our audience so I like the German translation better which says I am the Lord your doctor the same as um, we can say in the Sabbath verse principles I am the Lord your guide your plan maker your problem solver your burden bearer 
And uh, furthermore, God says in, in uh, Psalms 103, verses 4 and 5, I forgive all your iniquities, I heal all your diseases. Now, <clears throat> there came to a camp meeting in some part of the world a young married couple who had no children as yet, and when they heard this beautiful message on God being my doctor, they said, that is the word of God, and we accept the word of God, and we shall live by that word. Now, if we live by that word, then who alone should be our doctor? God and God alone. Not the local medical man uh, in the, the AMA, what do you call it in this part of the world? That is it the same? The AMA, what do you call it in Canada? Same, same is it? The Medical Association. Uh -huh. And the BMA, I think in England, the British Medical Association, uh, and so on. We don't uh, live by any of these other doctors. God alone is our doctor. And this young couple said, well, we shall live by every word of beseech in the mouth of God. If God says, I am your doctor, we accept that, and from this time on, he shall be my doctor. Well, they went home, a go with this newfound faith, and uh, a few weeks later, the wife became very seriously ill with some kind of difficulty, and there was kidney trouble or something like that. And... Um, Having gone to the correct procedures, they searched their hearts to find out where they may have been erring in their relationship to God. They put away all known sin. They gave the pollen to the Lord. And to their immense joy and satisfaction, the Lord worked for them and the, disease, and the sickness lifted and she had complete relief from her problem. And thus the Lord assured them that he was their doctor. But a few more weeks or months went by and there was an, the wife again became sick and this time the same procedure didn't work when they had given the case to God no change in her condition was apparent and instead she grew sicker and sicker and sicker until she was literally at the point of death now the pressure was on them now to see whether they would live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God or whether they would succumb to the pressure and yield to it and run to the easy out of going back to the old procedures again and one must face the fact, of course, when you're staring death straight in the face, it's no easy matter to live by every word, is it? It's no easy matter. And we can certainly sympathise with them very, very greatly in this respect. And they did succumb to the pressure. They did run to the local doctor. And uh, he, he pumped her full of all kinds of antibiotics and uh, drugs and so forth. He reprimanded them very severely for leaving the case for so long and said you should have come early because this, I only just managed to save her life. And when the life was saved, which it was, then these folk then took the stand well. They said, we, we have to revise our thinking now. The message on God as my doctor is not altogether sound because if we had lived by that message, then, then the wife would have died. So they assume anyway. But um, I'm quite convinced that if, if in an hour of extremity they had said, Lord, no matter what the pressure may be, you are our doctor, we live by every word of proceeds out of your mouth, and when you say you're the doctor, we believe that, and we live by that, and this case is wholly and solely in your care. And if they had reconfirmed their faith at that point of extremity, then God would have worked for them, and the life would have been saved. No doubt about it, in that situation. However, there will come cases, of course, when like John the Baptist or others, the Lord does let a person slip into the grave for reasons best known to him. And, of course, we have to um, recognise that possibility. But when this young couple folded under the pressure, then what did they demonstrate? They demonstrated that saving their own lives was more important to them, or survival was more important to them than living by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Right? Now, let me stress, of course, that if you haven't learned to walk with God in faith, if you have not yet made a, a sound commitment with Him, if you've not learned to commune with Him, if you don't have a living connection with Him, then you'd best go to a local doctor because the principles of divine healing do not work in the lives of those who do not have a living connection with God. So make sure you have the living connection before you make a covenant with God to let Him be your doctor. So, as I was saying, there is... There is usually an easy out some some way whereby we can turn back to the old ways again we're not confined god never confines us to, to a situation where there is no other possibility i should well i shouldn't say never because again i think of those disciples upon the lake that night and they certainly had no alternative did they because that, that storm was too strong for them in the end they had no choice but to trust god to save them or perish uh, in that case and possibly it's more fortunate for us if we are in such a situation 
Now Satan came to Jesus Christ and said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now what does this infer? Does it not infer that, 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 that Satan was, was suggesting a very powerful doubt to Christ's mind that he was, after all, the Son of God? It certainly does. The facts are, of course, that Satan was now pointing, pointing to the witness of sight and circumstances. He said, now look, he said, how can you be the Son of God? Look at yourself. Why? You're forsaken by God, that's obvious, and God certainly wouldn't forsake his own dearly beloved Son. That's, that's very, very clear. So there's one point to prove that you're not the Son of God. Secondly, you're forsaken by all mankind. There's no one here to stand by you. Thirdly, you're haggard and, uh, and dying from hunger. And um, God isn't providing food for you. So all these things add up to the fact that you're not the Son of God. You can't be because God just wouldn't treat his Son this way. Now, is this the same kind of argument that John the Baptist's friends put to him? exactly the same kind of arguments and in John the Baptist's case of course it caused him very deep doubt and perplexity but Jesus Christ would not listen to the arch deceiver although Sister White said it was not without a struggle that he did so page 119 not without a struggle could Jesus listen in silence to the arch deceiver but the Son of God was not the privileged divinity to Satan or to explain the reason of his humiliation alright now I mentioned the point yesterday and I'll say it again this morning that we're looking at these stories to find out how the application of the question what are my orders is a perfect safeguard. Now Satan said to Jesus Christ okay, you claim to be the son of God you say that 40 days ago God said this is my beloved son. All right then prove it. Prove it said Satan. If you're the son of God make these stones bread. But Christ said my orders, what are my orders? Do I have an order to prove myself? There's no such order. And the moment he asked that question and got that answer and said, I'll obey my orders, what did he have? Perfect protection, didn't he? Perfect protection. And you'll always find that that question provides you with perfect protection. Ask the question, what are my orders? Are my orders to uh, forsake God my doctor and go out and find another doctor? Are my orders... Um, to do this thing or that thing in Christ's case do I have orders to go down the mountain and supply myself with food I have no such order so I will not go down the mountain Is it, do I have orders to prove myself on making stones bread I have no such order so I won't do it and that question then was a perfect safeguard to Christ in every given situation the same as if Elijah in the gates of Jezreel asked himself the question do I have orders to run and what, what would the answer have been no, I don't, so I won't run. Would it have saved him? Yes. Absolutely. And the same as the apostles could have, should have asked the question, do we have orders to save ourselves from the storm? What would the answer have been? No, no our orders are to row this boat across the lake and it's God's responsibility to take care of that wretched storm. And if they'd asked those orders and got that answer and obeyed their orders, there would have been no problem. And we're going to find that if we will make it our business never to move unless we have an order and, and we're quite sure that we've got the order. Uh, sometimes people move from impulse and they don't take time to really go through the correct procedures and check the order out thoroughly to make sure it's from God and not from Satan, make sure it's not from their own enthusiasm either. Then, um, then if they would do that very carefully, then when the time of test and trial came, they would know that they are where God has put them, that they can rest in confidence and know that God will see them through that particular, particular struggle. I remember when I came to America for the first time back in 1964, I was most reluctant to leave Australia and come across the, the seas to a foreign country. Pardon my calling America a foreign country. <laughs> it was to me, yes. But not foreign like Germany or France or Spain where la different languages spoken. But when I worked in uh, the States, I was, I was an alien. Yeah, right. Yeah, I know, they called you that. Exactly right. Anyway, you know what I mean by a foreign country in this, in this case? It was a distant land, but America and Australia really, and Canada too, these three countries, Australia, America and Canada, really like one country because we all speak English, fortunately, and we have pretty much the same lifestyle and they're all big countries that so gives a person a big uh, viewpoint and so forth. Anyway, to come back to my point, I was most reluctant to come to America, to California back in 1964, and I spent one whole month of very, very careful testing 
and retesting of that call to make absolutely sure that this was God's call to me at that point of time. And uh, only when finally I, I was more or less in the position where I had no more, I had no more tests I could apply, and everything just kept saying go, go, go. Did I finally go? And when I got to America, everything went to pieces. Believe me, it's a long story, but uh, I, I'll tell it to you sometime perhaps. But uh, all the openings closed. People who asked me to come to that to be betrayers and enemies. And I, I was run out of one place after another and finally ended up at McCoy's place in Oakhurst, expecting a camping and finding none. And, uh, and I, I finally came to the place where I was right at the end of every possible, and every door was closed. There was not an opening anywhere in this, in this vast land. And the devil said to me, what a mistake you've made. You think that God was leading you, but look, if God had been leading you, why are you now with every door shut against you? And it was only because I had made such thorough work of testing my orders to make sure I did have those orders from God, not from myself or from Satan, that I was able to cast down some angers and hang on until doors did begin to open. And uh, they opened all right. And... Uh, Today, of course, we have a very large and, and successful work in both America, in the United States of America and Canada. But I can't overstress the importance of making absolutely sure that you do have orders from God, not just some enthusiastic impression that comes to your mind by Satan's inspiration or by your own wishful thinking. And uh, this underlines the necessity, of course, of each person gaining for themselves an experience and hearing the voice of God uh, as, a, as that voice brings their orders to them. Let's go back to page 363 for a moment, just as our time is running out. Page 363, the very last paragraph on the page. In all who are under the training of God is to be revealed a life that is not in harmony with the world, its customs or its practices, and everyone needs, I note these words down, and everyone needs to have a personal experience in obtaining a knowledge of the will of God. Right? We all need to have that kind of experience. We must have a personal experience in that regard so we know exactly what the Lord uh, gives us to do. And uh, when we gain that experience and are very, very careful and responsible, I mean, let me just repeat those two words, careful and responsible, not the person who lives by impressions or emotions. And we're very careful and responsible in making sure we know what God's orders are. Then we, then we obey those orders no matter what the cost may be until we get fresh ones. And don't expect to have fresh orders every day. Christ didn't get fresh orders for six weeks, did he? He went to the mountain, and not till six weeks later he get fresh orders, and in the meantime he was left to demonstrate his faithfulness to those orders and to show that survival was far less important than obedience, right? Survival was far less important than obedience. Now in human life, of course, which is the more important? Survival is the all-important thing, isn't it? When Christ left Lazarus to die and therefore violated the principle of survival, in fact um, put survival as a less important thing than the will of God and the glory of God, how did the apostles rate Jesus Christ in consequence? As a possible deceiver, right? They really, they really downgraded him because of that. But in Christ's mind, the, the will of God and the plans of God are much more important than survival and so he left Lazarus to die in order to work a far greater and more wonderful miracle a very short time after. Well, that's 45 minutes gone again, so I'll have to stop at this point. Are there any questions you'd like to ask on this presentation this morning? Yeah, how do you test God's orders? Well, you've heard the Sabbath rest message. You should know that answer. <laughs> Can't make it simple one book. <laughs> Read the book, then. <laughs> okay, just... Um, Keep, keep the question, I'll, I'll put it on tape in the next study period because um, it'd be good to have it on tape, I think. So I'll answer the question when we start the next study period. Yes. yes. Uh, where was that, that uh, promise that God would be our, our doctor? Exodus 15, verse 26. 15, 26. Right, then, no, 15, not 16, 15. It's the last line on the verse. The whole verse talks about uh, obeying God's commandment, but the last line says, I am the Lord that healeth thee, or ish bin der Herr dein Arzt.